that can only happen when we have a grateful heart. There cannot be love without gratitude. There cannot be real compassion without gratitude. A Vaishnava is grateful for everyone and anyone who has ever helped her or him ever. We're grateful for to our parents, for all they've done. We're grateful for our teachers, for whatever they've given us. We're grateful to our enemies, for what they've given us. We're grateful to all of our friends throughout our life. Anybody who's ever helped us, encouraged us with a single word or a single gesture of Vaishnava is so grateful that they honor that. That is why a devotee can bow down to every living entity. And that's what an Acharya does. Feel ourselves servants to all. Grateful for every situation. As we make spiritual advancement, we simply become more and more grateful. And as we become more grateful, we, become, we make more spiritual advancement. We were so unlimitedly grateful to Srila Prabhupada. But because Prabhupada is such a pure hearted Paramhamsa, he was more grateful to us, even the most insignificant disciples, because they were helping him in his service to his Guru Maharaj. His gratitude was deeper than ours. He was saving our lives and we were hardly doing anything. And he's grateful to us. That is the example. This is what Srila Prabhupada meant by simple living high thinking. Not trying to be controller proprietor, enjoyer. But being happy being the servant of the servant of the servant. Living in a simple way with a simple state of mind where we really are aware that we are depending on the grace of God and grateful. Of course, the village we're seeing now is symbolic. Because in the true village state, the reason, one of the reasons they put cow dung in the walls is of course it's antiseptic. It's very beautiful. But also because it's all over the place. <laughs> it's there. It's ecologically very pure, but it's... We don't have to go to the store to buy it. The cows are giving it for free. Yes? So it's very simple. Every morning, the people, the, the housewife just goes to the goshala fills the bucket up with cow dung, adds a little water, and then makes so many beautiful designs and puts it on all the walls and the floor and everywhere, and it's like a new house every day. So simple. Of course, in our case, devotees probably had to travel many, many miles to get this cow dung to put here today. <laughs> but it's so nice. In the room that I've been given at Radhagopinath Temple, all the wells are cow dung. And these wells have been there for about, what, six, seven years. And nothing falls off it. It's all perfect. 
doesn't cost anything. We just got it free from our cows. And I'm not going to mention names, but some of the wealthiest people in Bombay and some extremely wealthy people from Hollywood, Beverly Hills, and America, they come to my room and they say, these are beautiful walls. How do you do it? What is this? Now, the people from Bombay, when you say it's cow dumb, they say, oh, fantastic. You know, I have to do this in my house. They're living in mansions. But nothing can compare to cow dung. Plaster chips away. Every year, plaster paint is coming off. You have to repaint and repaint and repaint. Cow dung, year after year after year, it's like new. It's textured. It's so beautiful in color, in texture, in design. The people from the West, they say, what? I want walls like this. They have marble walls, but it doesn't have the feeling as cow dung. What is this? Where did you buy this? What company? <laughs> I said, it's cow dung. They go, mm -hmm. <laughs> they almost moved like cows when I told them that. They couldn't. You put cow, cow dung on your walls? Doesn't it smell horrible? I said, well, smell it. It smells good. <laughs> they had to admit it. Don't flies come and everything? I said, where are the flies? It's beautiful. But the real beauty of it is it's, it's given by God freely right outside your door. This is the beauty of village life. And the straw. It's growing. It's growing right in your fields. You just make your house. <laughs> Amazing. And wood, put some wood beams, take some straw. Everything's right there. It's so simple. And the treasures we get from that no one in this world, nothing in this world, death itself cannot take it away. Bhakti is real wealth. Simple living high thinking. When we have a simple non-envious heart. Envy is a virulent disease. It's a disease that causes the heart to blaze with fire. It's a disease that causes family members to become enemies. A disease that cause, causes races, religions, nations to become enemies. Envy. Competition based on wholesome desire to do something wonderful for my family and for the world and for God is good. But when competition is based on envy, it can only be destructive. Why are we envious? Because we want to be the controller. That's why envy comes into our heart. We cannot tolerate somebody's not what I want them to be. We cannot tolerate that things are not going the way I want them to go. Krishna tells Arjuna, you can understand this message because you are not envious. critical. 
Pariksit Maharaj was not envious. That's why he could hear the Bhagavatam seven days and attain the supreme perfection. Some of us have been listening to the Bhagavatam for 30 years. Why aren't we perfect? We have to become non-envious like Parikshit. Even when he was cursed to die by a little child, he was not envious. He did not seek revenge. He was grateful. Cursed to die at the prime of his life in seven days. Parikshit was grateful because there was no envy in his heart. He didn't seek revenge, rather he just, it's not the child, it's Krishna. It's Krishna's mercy on me. Let me go to the Ganga and let me hear the glories of the Lord. Such a grateful heart. He adjusted to the situation by turning to Krishna. That is Krishna consciousness. Ishvara Parama Krishna Satchidananda Vigraha Anadira Dira Govinda Saravakarana Karanam this verse begins, the whole Brahma Samhita that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu worshipped so much, the very beginning, the invocation is Ishwara Padma Krishna. Understand this, please. Brahma Samhita describes the whole philosophy of Krishna consciousness. It describes the spiritual world of Goloka. It describes the position of all the demigods. Everything is there. But how does it begin? Ishvara Parama Krishna. That the supreme controller is Krishna. What does that mean? That means it's not me. Ishvara Parama Krishna Satchidananda Vigraha. Krishna is the supreme controller of all controllers and all material and spiritual worlds and every living entity is under the control of Krishna. Directly or indirectly. And Krishna's body is eternal, full of knowledge, full of bliss. He's the origin of everything that exists, the, the cause of all causes. I take shelter of Krishna. Until we accept the principle of Ishwara Parama Krishna, we can't really understand the rest of Brahma Samhita. That's the beginning. To be non envious, to give up the conception that I'm the Lord, I'm the controller, I'm the proprietor, I'm the enjoyer. To be the servant. Then we can actually, not just theoretically, but with realization, we can understand what is Goloka Vrindavan. And we can enter into the Lord's eternal Leela. Trinadapi Sunichena, Tador Iba Sehishnuna. Amani na mana deena kirtaniya sada hari. This is gratitude. This is love. To be humble like a blade of grass, tolerant like a tree. To offer all respect to others from the heart and expect none in return. With that consciousness, Krishna reveals himself and we could take
taste the sweetness as we chant the holy names. This beautiful village setting. Actually, devotees stayed up all night to make this for the pleasure of all the other devotees. In Krishna's lila, Krishna, if we read Krishna book, Srimad Bhagavat, even the simplest things, Krishna makes everything so suspenseful. Yes? Mm. The cowherd boys, they bring their calves to the Yamuna to drink some water, and then they all die due to poison. And Krishna glances at them and brings them back to life. Then he climbs up a kadamba tree, tightens his belt, and jumps in Yamuna. And although he was so small and light, Yashoda Mai is carrying him in her arms as she's doing her household chores. But yet when he went into this lake in the Yamuna, he was so heavy that created massive waves overflooding just so he would disturb Kaliya. And Kaliya comes out with all of his flaming heads with hoods on the top and jewels and fire coming out of his mouth poison sealing out of his nostrils his eyes all of these hundred heads had eyes that were blazing red with anger hissing can you imagine the stereo effect of hundred heads hundred principal heads hissing, this massive serpent. It's really exciting. Then he wraps Krishna up in his coils and Krishna's acting totally helpless. And the Brijabhasis, they see inauspicious omens in the air, in the sky, in the land. And immediately when they see anything auspicious, they worry about Krishna. And they went running and running and running, and they saw Krishna and the cows with their footprints and hoof prints, and they were following, following. Then they come to the lake and they see little Gopal in the coils of this massive, monstrous, venomous snake. And for, about, for over half hour, Krishna just remained like that as everyone was crying and screaming and some were trying, Yashoda Mai wanted to jump in the Yamuna to, to, to just either die in the poison or fight the snake. But all the other gopis stopped her. Why did Krishna do that? Why did he let that happen? He could have just in the super soul of Kaliya not allowed him to come there. And then the calves would have drunk the water and the cowherd boys would have drunk the water and they would have just had a nice day. Krishna staged it all just to make a simple ordinary thing very, very exciting. And in their excitement, to make everybody really, really, really intensely cry out for Krishna. And then he danced on their heads. And everybody was enjoying watching his dance. So devotees worked very, very hard. Radha Gopinath Prabhu explained the story about the 
one good leaf, yes? What is it? It's so beautiful. They've just finished everything. Working all night, arranging for so many days. Sleepless. And then... Storm. And Govinda Prabhu was telling me there was a storm. And the Pandal person was here, and he, he said, you know, somehow after the end of that storm, he said, somehow or other we can salvage everything. But then a few minutes later, another storm. Radha Kum Prabhu, he told me we cannot have the program. There's six inches of water. Govinda Prabhu said we cannot have the program because it's completely a swampy area and everything's been destroyed and the pundal could fall down. Yes. And so many other people. You know, I was listening. You know, said, as far as I'm concerned, whatever makes you happy, I'm happy. But <clears throat> then we had meeting in the room. Many of you were just doing kirtan, wondering what is happening. How many of you were in that state of mind between 8 o'clock and 9.30? Well, while there was a sweet kirtan in the temple, and thousands of people who couldn't fit in the temple were just swarming all over the place, so nobody knew what was happening, nobody knew what was not happening. It was quite suspenseful, was it not? But in the room, the cow dung room, <laughs> so many of the leaders were there, all debating. Some were saying, we should do it, we should go. No problem. Tell everyone to bring the umbrellas. And others were saying, no, what about the children? They'll get sick, and the parents, and, and it, it's not nice, and we'll have to abbreviate everything. And it was so much, for an hour and a half, there was debate. And I'm not going to mention names, but the amazing thing is some of the most scholarly, clear-minded, shastrically illuminated of all the devotees, they'd say, we should definitely do it. And then five minutes later, we should definitely not do it. <laughs> and then a few minutes later, I don't know if we should do it or not. <laughs> and some of our very, very big industrialist type devotees who are very, you know, they're leading corporations and making decisions and, the, you know, each decision is tens of millions of dollars and crores of rupees and they're very strongly saying yes we should do it and then six minutes later no we cannot do it <laughs> then three minutes later yes we must do it then five minutes later I don't know what we should do <laughs> yes go remember this was the dynamics it's very intense the only two people that were consistent were Sukadev Maharaj was yes, and Govinda Prabhu was no. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else was, I was just enjoying like anything, watch me. <laughs> it was so exciting. Just to see these, these clear, topmost managers, empowered Brahmins, changing their mind every three minutes. <laughs> I asked, how could you keep changing your mind? 
office five minutes ago and you said this, then you said that, then you said this, and now you're saying that, and now you're saying this and that. And he said, well, my heart says one thing and my mind says the other thing. It was very exciting. So, by Krishna's grace, something just so simple became so suspenseful. And now, we were all caught in the, we were all like the Brijabhasis bewildered. What are we going to do about Krishna in the coils of Kaliya? But now the sun is out. We're watching Krishna dancing. So when Krishna puts reversals, when Krishna puts obstacles on the path, it actually makes Krishna consciousness really exciting, suspenseful. And it also brings us together. It's the willingness to be grateful, to be simple at heart. And somehow or other, everything looks so nice, despite all the rain. Yes? And something very positive came out of it. Would you like to know? From a purely material perspective. If it wasn't for those rains, all those hours I'm speaking, you would have been miserably moving around on the ground, sitting, yes, even dry ground. But because of the rains, everyone almost here has their own private, personal chair. <laughs> Let us thank Indra by chanting Hari Bo. It's loud enough so he can hear you, please. Nice chairs, yes? <laughs> so there's blessing in the skies in every difficulty that comes in our life. This consciousness or Krishna consciousness is the gift that Srila Prabhupada came to this world to give us. And if only we're grateful, not expecting things to go our way, not demanding that that material nature or other people satisfy my egoistic, selfish expectations and desires. But to be humble. Like Kuvera. Like his Gurudev, His Holiness Bhakti Tirta Swami Maharaj. His Holiness Sridhar Maharaj. Stoka Krishna Prabhu. the Avanti Brahmin. And like so many devotees, we read about and we see. Simplicity, humility, and gratitude. It makes Krishna consciousness beautiful in every situation. Instead of being depressed when there's reversals, we become fascinated by Krishna's suspenseful ways of 
orchestrating our lives. When we see through the eyes that Prabhupada gave us through his words, life is really beautiful. Death is really beautiful. Why? Because Krishna is really beautiful. And we're remembering him in the good and the bad and the failure and the success in the happiness and distress in the pleasure and the pain in the health and the disease in the joy and the sorrow we remember Krishna and we see his beauty in that situation and life is beautiful because that vision is the spiritual world. This is the mood that Prabhupada has taught us by his example and the lessons he's given us by his words. And it is this simplicity of consciousness that facilitates unity. To be a servant means we're, we are the well-wisher. I'm serving you to make you happy. That will give my soul happiness. If I'm serving you to make me happy, then I probably won't be happy. Why? Because it's a gesture of selfishness. Selfishness does not give any pleasure to the heart. In fact, it burns the heart. It gives some temporary soothing massage to the mind and senses, maybe, but it burns the heart. But we're so caught up in the mind and senses, we don't even notice the burning in the heart, but it's burning. When Bhagavan Das Thakur explained, higher than the heavenly planets, higher than achievement of all the eight mystic cities in full, higher than liberation or mukti, the highest position one can achieve is to be the servant of the servant of the servant. Because that's the state of the highest bliss. Because that's the state that connects us to the all-beautiful, all-attractive Krishna. Prabhupada said you could show your love for me by how you cooperate. There are tens and millions of reasons to argue, to fight, to go our own ways, to despise each other. But there's one reason to offer respect, to cooperate, and to learn to love each other. What is that one reason? It's the way to please Krishna. All the other tens of millions of reasons displease Krishna. We want to show our love for Prabhupada. That's what pleases Krishna. It's a challenge in Kali Yuga. If we cooperate, Krishna manifests. We see to some extent in Pune, 
and Bombay devotees to some extent are able to cooperate and just through that cooperation with Krishna in the center it's attracting hundreds and thousands of people to Krishna consciousness. People are not coming because they just hear the philosophy. They may hear the philosophy. Their hearts open to believe the philosophy, to accept the philosophy. When they see a cooperative, united family that keeps Krishna in the center. The fact is, as we're cooperating, Krishna manifests in that Sangam, and because Krishna is so beautiful, Krishna is so attractive, people want to be a part of it. People want to give their lives. That's the foundational principle that is causing this expansion. If we're not cooperating, if we're not in a loving family environment, there are places that follow the same exact philosophy, but why the expansion isn't there? Because the unity and the cooperation of the hearts, the love and care among the devotees is not there. The philosophy comes alive, becomes real, when there's Vaishnav relationships. But it is an austerity. The austerity is when we want, when we have this ingrained, deep-rooted tendency to be the proprietor, the controller, the enjoyer, and we're expecting things to go our way and people to be the way we want them to be. And we're in the center, not Krishna, but I, my desire is in the center. Very difficult. But we have those tendencies. But we put the higher principle as the priority. What will please Prabhupada? What will please Krishna? It's definitively spoken. Cooperation, unity, based on these higher principles. Through that process, we can transcend our differences. We can transcend our own egos. We can transcend the egos of others. We can transcend our own fastidious, selfish dictations of the mind. We don't demand. We humbly serve. Then we can taste the sweetness of the holy name. We can taste the beauty of Krishna consciousness and we can be empowered individually and collectively with the beauty of Krishna to attract thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people's hearts. This is the offering of gratitude that we can offer to the lotus feet of Srila Prabhupada individually and together. This offering will open our hearts to receive Krishna. Prabhupada is giving us Krishna. But love is reciprocal. Prabhupada is giving us Krishna. He's giving us the way to receive Krishna. If we make this offering to Prabhupada of our gratitude, our humility, and the cooperation that that creates, then we're opening our hearts to receive what Prabhupada is giving us the spiritual world, Krishna Prema, love of God. Thank you very much.